I'm gonna say that one more time because I want you to write it down. Sometimes you are plagued with the disease that you're called to cure. So a lot of y'all, if you've ever heard me speak, you may know that my mom is an addict and she's somebody that um, that I've had to distance myself from. But sometimes what I've learned through the the situation is how to handle a lot of it. And even though she's decided to do other things and went down a whole different path. One thing that I love is that I have had the beautiful opportunity to um, love on, mentor, become a great friend of a woman who has overcome this struggle. Um, And so I'm so grateful to be, um, you know, that that saying, I have goosebumps right now, but um, sometimes you're plagued with the disease that you're called to cure. And so sometimes, you know, when you have somebody who comes in, you make it a little nervous when they have, you know, they, we all bring our baggage, right? We bring our baggage into Mary Kay, but you know what God does? He really molds us. Um, and so I wanted to give Carla just a second before I get into my training about the Esther anointing. Mm, it's good. Um, but I wanted to give Carla a second to share her story with you because, y'all, as she moves up this career path, she's got a lot to bring to the table, and I know she's going to mentor a lot of girls along the way um, that have gone through things. And so I hope that her story touches your heart. Um, I hope it inspires you, makes you feel like you can do anything that you set your mind to, and whatever stronghold that Satan has on you, that you get to decide if he continues to have it. Mm-hmm. That was really good. <laughs> so I'm going to stand with you so you don't okay. feel weird. So I tried to write this down. I tried to rehearse. I tried to do a bunch of things, and none of it happened. So I... Um, my prayer was that I would be able to let the Lord speak through me as I share this very vulnerable piece of my story. Um, but I prayed about my Mary Kay journey the entire time, even before I signed up as a consultant. Um, and so I have consulted God with every piece of it. And I recently rewrote my I story because I felt like I was telling me that I needed to be real and vulnerable with the people that I was facialing and working with so that they could see a piece of me. Um, My story really began when I was three weeks old. I was put up for adoption um, and I was adopted by a beautiful family. I was the first child, the first grandchild. I was probably the most loved child in Powderfield. (laughs) I don't know, but I was the favorite child. I grew up knowing that I was adopted. I was never not told. It was just something that I knew. And how many of you have have kids? Oh wow, that's a whole bunch. Okay, so you know as well as I do that a small child may hear something and think that it means something totally different than what it actually means, right? So I grew up hearing the adults around me say Carla was given up for adoption. Oh, oh, oh. And I internalized that. And I believed that what I understood as a little child, little Carla, knew that that meant if you give something up that you don't want it anymore. And I believed that. I really did. But I pushed it down inside and nobody knew. I was very careful. But as I got older, I really felt like that I had to perform and I had to be perfect. And I had to, because if if I was given up one time, something surely was wrong with me. I might not be able to see it, but it had to be there, right? Because I was given up. And so that plagued me and that stayed with me. And that continued until I was about 11, and that was the first time I saw an addictive behavior. No one in my life, um, no one in my life really knew uh, that I felt that way. When my mom and dad found out later, they were so appalled 
that I, you know, believed that and thought that. They never wanted me to think that, but that was just my interpretation of it. And Satan used that as a stronghold in my life mm -hmm. to create this sense of rejection and unworthiness and abandonment and fear. And so I operated on the lowest tier possible. I was so careful. I dated low. My friends were like, you know, rejects. I, seriously, I mean, and I always shot low. I didn't try. I didn't want to believe that I could do and be better. And my addictive behavior started when I was 11 with food. And that tells you that it can be anything. Right, so it went from food to soda to cigarettes as I got older to I had a back injury and I was introduced to prescription pain medicine, which was amazing. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then later on, it was um, relationships with the opposite sex where they were just unhealthy choices. If there was a narcissist in the room, they found me <laughs> immediately. <laughs> I was like candy for them. Um, but later it, it moved into alcohol and it moved into drugs finally at the end. And uh, it was when I became addicted to cocaine that I lost everything. I lost a great job. Um, I got my degree later in life and I got this amazing job and I thought it was going to be spectacular and it wasn't, it was hard and I wasn't prepared for hard, you know? Um, so I began to drink to cope and then I met that guy who was just terrible and, um, he introduced me to cocaine and I ended up losing that job. I lost every friend that I ever had. I... For me, the good thing is I don't remember hardly any of it. So how did you come back from that? Like what was your steps to like moving forward? Yeah, I, um, I put myself in rehab. There's a wonderful um, free rehab facility called the Miracle Hill Renewal Center. And I had no money, no job. And so I went into uh, rehab at Miracle Hill. It's supposed to be a six month program. It was nine for me. Um, but that was where I really became familiar with um, God. I learned God in a different way. It became really real to me. And I developed a very strong relationship with the Lord during that time. Today, I stand before you sober from alcohol and drugs for four years. <laughs> struggles with recruiting right the the reason what brought me to Mary Kay was that I had a very real and urgent dental need that was unexpected I wasn't prepared I didn't have enough money I had a little bit in savings and all the things and so my lovely friend Tracy Cook um, kept asking me to do Mary Kay things and I liked Tracy so I went um, and Tracy would ask me to do one more thing and I'd be like okay and so I did it Finally, the epitome of layering was what happened with me. I got to the hard ass. What Nikki was like, what is it? Why won't you say yes? <laughs> you know, and uh, I finally said yes. And um, Mary Kay. Took four times though. Four, four yeah. times. That okay, was over a period of months. Like months. it didn't happen in a week. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I look back and I say to myself, and I've told Tracy before, what would have happened if she would have stopped asking? Mm. What would have happened? I would not be here because I didn't know I needed Mary Kay. I really, really believed that I was going to come into Mary Kay. I was going to pay that dental bill. I mean, I was looking at implants, bone grafts, you know, two surgeries and a bunch of other things. And so I came into Mary Kay and 
I started earning money, I realized I could sell. I didn't know that about myself. I realized I liked to compete. I didn't know that about myself. <laughs> I, I didn't, I, because I always shot so low. I didn't know. But what I found was a sisterhood. Mm -hmm. I found some sisters and family. Mm -hmm. I found women that loved on each other and really meant it. You know, there was no like mean-spirited competition. It was, yes, go girl, you know. And I didn't, never had I seen that, you know, growing up an only child, I didn't, didn't have that. And it was beautiful and it was, it was awesome. You know, and then I started developing a relationship with Nikki and she began to mentor me. And I began to feel in my spirit that God was calling me to directorship. Mm. And I said, God, are you sure? <laughs> are, you, are you sure? And I felt like, yes, he was. And what I had wrote down originally was that I was, my goal was to transition to directorship in 2025. And I have since decided that I think 2024 is yeah. there. <laughs> and my final thing that I remember from what I wrote down was that in the words of our founder, Mary Kay Ash, I can, I will, I must. <sighs>